Hi! In this video we're going to get some practice with concavity and we're also going to define what an inflection point is through some fascinating examples. Alright, so if our first example is just going to be a picture, we'll get to the equations later. Here I've drawn a picture of a function f of x versus x. Now right below it, I've got a picture of the derivative of f of x, which is to say that this middle picture has the same correspondence, um, the same x-axis, but instead of plotting the original function, this middle one right here plots with the value of the slope of the tangent line. Okay? So that is to say that if your function is going up right here, then the slope of the tangent line should be positive, that's right, and so I should expect a positive number, or a number that's greater than zero above the x-axis here in f prime. Alright, and then below that, I've actually drawn a graph that same corresponds to these two graphs. It's the second derivative of the original function, and it's the derivative of the first derivative. The second derivative is the derivative of the first derivative. Okay? So that is to say that if I imagined what the tangent line was on a graph of this function, right here, what would the slope of the tangent line be right here? Negative, right? It's a negative number. So then when I look at f double prime, which represents the slope of the tangent line to f prime, I should expect to see a value that's below the x-axis or a negative value. You might want to just stare at this graph for a little while and confirm for yourself in a number of different ways how this represents the derivative of this and how this represents the derivative of this by picturing some tangent lines. Okay, pause the video if you need some time to look at that. I definitely want you to understand that. Um, and that's going to really relate to our example here. We're going to go back to the f prime sum no sign number line from last week. We're going to locate the critical points on f of x. And then we're going to draw the f prime sine number line. What was that for? Do you guys remember what this did for us? That's right, it classified all the critical points as either relative max, relative min, or horizontal point of inflection. Okay? Then we're going to compare that with a new type of diagram, new but a similar concept, where we're going to do the same thing except for double prime. This is going to be the f double prime sine number line. So the places that we're going to tick off here are going to be places where the second derivative is equal to zero, and then we're going to see where the second derivative changes sign on here. Now you can see up here I've written inflection points here. What an inflection point is, it is a point at which the concavity changes. So if the concavity, which is represented by the sine, positive or negative, of the second derivative, if this sine changes sine, then we will have a point of inflection, because an inflection point is a place where concavity changes from positive to negative concavity. Now before we begin with all of this, I would like you to just um, take a look at this graph of f of x and see if you can answer some questions for me. First of all, do you see any relative maxima? You do? What letter of x represents a relative maxima? A, that's right, x equals a right here, relative maxima higher than everything around it. Very good. Do you see any relative minima? x equals c? I hope so. I hope you're picturing those from last week. That's lower than everything around it, so x equals c is a relative minima. And do you see any horizontal points of inflection? That's going to be somewhere where the tangent line looks like it has a zero flat slope, like this point E right here. However, it does not classify as a maxima or minima because it is neither higher than everything around it, nor is it lower than everything around it. But it is horizontal, it's flat. And remember that the flatness of it, the fact that the derivative is equal to zero, is what's going to define a critical point on f of x for us. Critical points are the points where either the derivative equals zero or the derivative does not exist. Now from these three graphs here, you can see that there are no places where the derivative does not exist. I've got it pictured here for all values of x pictured of f. So that leaves us with critical points being just defined as the places of horizontal tangents, the places where the derivative is equal to zero, where the slope of the tangent line is completely flat. You can see that A, C, and E um, all satisfy that. Okay? So when it says locate all the critical points on f of x here, again we're looking for the place where the derivative is equal to zero, and that happens when x is equal to A, C, and E. Alright, and this is the first step in the four-step method of classifying all relative extrema. 
We find the critical points and then we take off the critical points on the number line, A, C, and E, just like that. And then we have to fill in the sign. Now, if we actually had a functional form for the derivative, then we could use some test points inside these regions, and these would probably be numbers then. And then we could plug and chug and see if the numbers come out plus or minus. However, we're not presented with any functional form of this function, so we're going to have to use either this picture here or this picture right here to fill out the rest of the f prime sine number line. So before I go into it, I'd like you to try it right now. So go ahead and pause the video and try to fill in the rest of the f prime sine number line and then use the first derivative test to confirm the classification that we already saw by i here. All right, I hope that you're playing along, and now I'll show you two different ways in which you could have filled up the plus and minuses in the f prime sum number line. The first way is that if you have the original function, you could say if that function's going up, what does that mean about the derivative? It means it's positive, right? So for everywhere where x is less than a here, it's always going up, and so the derivative always has a positive sign in that region. The second way that you could have figured that out is that I also actually have a graph of the derivative right here. And remember, if this is the actual derivative f prime, then to say that f prime is positive is synonymous with seeing that f prime itself is above the x-axis in the positive category. Below it is negative, above it is positive. So you can see for all values of x less than a, the derivative is a positively signed quantity. And so, again, we arrive at positive there. All right. Likewise, um, between a and c, you can see not only is the function going down, but its derivative is below the x-axis. And so that leads me to say that the derivative is negative inside that region. All right. And then between the regions c and e, the function is going up. Likewise, the derivative is positively signed, it's above the x-axis, and so I've got pluses going on here, and then likewise for the e, looks like it's going up, looks like the derivative is greater than zero, and so I've got more positives right there. Okay, this is kind of a review from last week, so let's go into classification of the extrema via the first derivative test. And remember, the first derivative test is a test that is to be performed on the critical points themselves. And what you do is you try to figure out if it's a max, a min, or a horizontal point of inflection by seeing how it changes sign. So it looks like the function is going up, and then it's going down, and so that means A right here was a max. Right? Oh yeah, it was a max. I already pointed it out by I. But even if I didn't have this picture here, if I had this f prime sine number line, I should be able to reason that x equals a is a max. Likewise, I should be able to reason that x equals c is a min because the function was going down and then it hit bottom and then it was going back up again. And so that's how I can reason that x equals c is going to be a min without even looking at this picture, right? And then what happens when it doesn't change sign at all? Do you guys remember? That's one of those HPIs, a horizontal point of inflection. And finally today, we're going to get to learn where the I comes from. That means it's a point of inflection, and that's going to be a place where the function actually changes sign. That's why it's called a point of inflection. You see, it's positive. It remains positive. It did not change sign. Horizontal point of inflection. Now, last week I told you that if it didn't change sign, you can go ahead and write HPI. That's what it turns out to be for the examples that you are presented with generally in this type of class. However, that wasn't technically right. I'm not actually allowed to call a point a point of inflection or inflection point unless the concavity has changed. An inflection point is a point on a graph where the concavity changes sign. I haven't written that down, but let me say it twice. You might want to write it down. An inflection point is a point on a graph where the concavity changes. So either it changes from concave up to concave down, or vice versa, changed its inflection. I'm sorry, changed its concavity, so it's called an inflection point. Okay, so let's go back here. We've already talked about how to recognize where the function is increasing, decreasing. Now let's talk about where is this function concave up and where is it concave down. If you saw the last video, at the end of the video, you saw me give you a hint to say something is concave down, where if the rain comes down on you, you're underneath an umbrella. 
Concave up is like a cup, where if the rain comes down on you, it would collect in a pool. Can you guys try to find the regions of concavity here, concave up versus concave down? The other thing I told you in that video, the last video, the introduction of concavity, was that if the second derivative is greater than zero, that means it's concave up. If the second derivative is negative or less than zero, that function is concave down. Right. So by looking at this and looking at this, between all that thinking, can you locate the regions where the function is concave up, let's say? Concave up. That's like a cup. So already, this part of it looks like a cup to me, so I'm going to say this region in here, I have a feeling is concave up. Now to really confirm that, I'm going to go down here to my graph of the second derivative. Where is the second derivative greater than zero? According to this, between b and d, the second derivative is positive. So between b and d right here, between here and here, the function is concave up. Does that make sense? It may be easier for you to analyze the sign of the second derivative at, the, um, you know, at first because it's a little bit hard to see the places where concavity changes on a graph. Sometimes it's not obvious. Okay, so speaking to that, let's just look for places here where we can still see that the second derivative is positively signed. The second derivative has a value above the x-axis. That looks like from x equals e onwards, and so from x equals e onwards, the function is also concave up. And then if you look at it again, you can see, yeah, that kind of looks like I was saying it's like a cup, it's concave up. Okay? And concave down, it's upside down, it's like an umbrella, right? So you can see, hopefully here, that if I was hiding under here, the rain wouldn't get me. So this part right here is concave down. Okay, and likewise, if we analyze the sign of the second derivative, it's all negative down here. Okay, and then over here, you see this little blip here between D and E, where the second derivative becomes negative again? That's going to be a place where the function is concave down. A little bit hard to see. Over here and here, it's kind of obvious, concave down versus concave up. When you get to here, it's kind of hard to see. It's concave down. It's got that mild decreasing nature to it. Concave up, you see, it's kind of curved up like a cup. So it's a little bit hard to see. Good thing we have the calculus, huh? The calculus we'll get to um, on the next example when I have functional forms. But before we do that, I want to introduce you the concept of the f prime sine number line. It's very similar to what you did here with the f prime sine number line, except you're doing it on the second derivative instead of the first derivative, okay? So this is how we do the f prime sine number line. Notice that for the f prime number line, first we had to find the places where f prime was equal to zero. Likewise, over here, the step one is going to be find the x values where the second derivative of x is equal to zero or does not exist. Now the does not exist part is going to come into play later, maybe when we're accidentally, not accidentally, but if you divide out by zero or something like that, that makes it not exist. We'll see that in other examples. Here you can see the second derivative is very well defined for all values of x, and so we're just looking for values of x where the second derivative is equal to zero, and we're going to tick those off on this f prime sign number line, sorry, the f double prime sign number line, just as we did for the f prime one here. For what letter values of x over here is the second derivative equal to zero? Can you see it? Those are the x-intercepts on that graph, right? Right here, b, and then d and e. And so those are the places that I'm going to take off. And I'll try to make them line up with what I saw before. b, d, and e are all places where the second derivative is equal to zero. Now, why do I care so much about that special value equal to zero? That's because zero is the dividing line between positive and negative values. You can't jump from being negative to positive or vice versa unless you're going to either continuously go through zero or do something really weird and that's when that does not exist gets into play. Okay? But basically zero is the dividing line between plus and minus. 
So that means that if it hit zero right here, and it hasn't hit zero anywhere in here, it must have one distinct sign, either positive or negative, for all values inside this region. This is the same logic we worked with for the f prime sine number line. Okay? So, is the second derivative positive or is it a negative for x less than b? Well, there's a couple ways we can see that. We can look at this graph right here of the second derivative and see that that's all negatively valued. We can also look up at the original function and recognize that that function is behaving in a concave down manner. Both of those lead us to conclude that the second derivative is negatively signed for all x values in this region right here. Okay? Now between b and d, we're going to do the same type of thing. Determine the sign of the second derivative. Right here you can see it's positive. Likewise, the function acting in a concave up manner um, leads us to believe that its second derivative is positive. And it's got to be positive for every value between b and d because this is where it hits zero and that's where it hits zero. And so it's got to have just that one sign in between. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's do that again between D and E. You can see that it's negatively signed. So we get the little minuses there. And then after E, it's going to be positively signed, just like this. And now once we have this nice F double prime sign number line, what this can be used on is determining locations of inflection points. Okay? So once again, the F prime sign number line determines classification of the critical points. It determines your relative mins, your relative maxes, and, well, actually, I'm going to take this back. This is not what determines your HPI. Really, what is getting determined on the F prime sign number line is your relative mins and relative maxes, which are your concrete conclusions from the first derivative test. This F double prime sign number line is really the place where we are going to determine all points of inflection, whether they be horizontal or otherwise. You can see that in E here, we have a horizontal point of inflection because it changes concavity and it's also horizontal. The fact that it's horizontal means that it has a zero slope on its tangent line and that's why it appears as a tick mark on the F prime sign number line. The fact that its second derivative is equal to zero and that it changes sign in its second derivative and changes concavity is what really makes it an inflection point right here because an inflection point is a point on the graph in which the graph changes concavity, either changes from concave down to up or up to down, okay? So using the information from the F double prime sign number line will allow us to conclude whether a point is an inflection point or not. It just has to change sign. Up here, if it changed from plus or minus, it's called a max. If it changes from minus to plus, it's called a min. Down here, if it just changes sign at all, it's called an inflection point. If it doesn't change sign, it's not called an inflection point. There's not two types, like how there's two types of relative extrema, the max and the min. There's just inflection point. So it changed from minus to positive, so that makes this an inflection point. It changed again, so right here and right here, these are both inflection points. These are separately both inflection points. At any point, if the graph changes from being concave down to concave up or vice versa, that is called a point of inflection. You can see the function was concave down, then it was concave up, then it was concave down, and then it was concave up. And so all in all, it switched its concavity three times, and you can see three different inflection points on the graph. Okay, so let me erase this part right here and see if we go back to this graph, can you actually just, by eye, pick out those inflection points again? The places where the graph changes in concavity. Can you kind of see it a little better now? It was concave down, and right here, inflection point, it changed to concave up. Then it hit a relative min. Is this an inflection point right here, x equals c? No, this is not an inflection point because it's concave up here and it's concave up as well on the other side. It did not change concavity. C is not an inflection point. But here at D, it changed from concave up to concave down, and so therefore it's an inflection point. 
Now E, this is the one that we were calling HPI before, not only is it an inflection point, but it is also horizontal. So that's why we call this the horizontal point of inflection, or HPI. It was concave down, and then it changed from con to concave up. Okay, so we're going to practice this on a bunch of functions. Um, sometimes we'll have the pictures, and sometimes we'll have an equation. So let's move on to a couple exercises where we have an actual equation to work with. <coughs> What I'm going to ask you to do inside these exercises is, given the equation, I want you to draw the f prime sine number line, and I want you to draw the f double prime sine number line, and I want you to draw the appropriate conclusions from each type of sine number line. Oops. <laughs> All right, so here we go. Exercise number one, y is equal to one-third x cubed minus three x squared plus five x plus two. I want you to draw the f prime sine number line. I want you to draw the f double prime sine number line. And that's going to help us to answer the question where the question is find all relative max, relative min, and inflection points. Okay, so the overall question is really find all the relative extrema and the inflection points. And it's going to involve drawing the f prime sine number line. Oh, sorry, you need some place to calculate the derivative first. And the f double prime one. Okay, so how about over here, we just call this y prime. And how about, let's start the problem by calculating y prime and y double prime. And that's something that hopefully now you feel is pretty straightforward. Okay, go ahead and calculate both of those derivatives. And then over here, I will draw both of the sine number lines. And we'll call this y prime, we'll call this y, because it's called y in the problem. Hey, how are you doing on that derivative? Are you using the quotient rule? You better not be using the quotient rule. I hope you're not using the quotient rule on that one, and that you're just using the power rule and the constant multiple rule, okay? So you see how some people would see this as a fraction, x3 over 3, but it's not something for the quotient rule because it's not any x's on the bottom. It's just the constant multiple 1 third times x3. So bringing the 3 down to cancel the 1 third, the first term just becomes x squared. Bringing this 2 down to multiply by the minus 3, we get a minus 6x. This one turns into a 5. What happens to the 2? Just disappeared, right? Okay, so that's the first derivative. Second derivative, hopefully you got 2x minus 6 for that. And now on each one of these derivatives, we have to ask ourselves the question, when, for what x values, are they equal to 0 or does not exist? And this is where we go back to the polynomials. These are both polynomial in nature. This is a polynomial as well. And so you know that the polynomials are really well behaved. They exist for all real numbers x. So we don't have to solve any places where this is equal to does not exist. We just have to solve the places where it's equal to zero, and where the places where the first derivative is equal to zero are the critical points, okay? So the places that solve this equation right here, these are the critical points. When this is set equal to zero and we solve this, these are possible candidates for inflection points, but setting this equal to zero does not give us critical points, okay? It's only the first derivative. So let's solve that out and get the critical points. Those are the points that we're going to take off on the f prime sine number line. Um, if you want, you can use a quadratic formula, but I would hope that you would feel comfortable enough to try to factor this one out into these terms right here. And so, solving this out, we get the conclusion that x is either equal to 5 or 1. And so the critical points on x are x equals 1 and 5. And so we're just going to take off a 1 and a 5 right there. Okay, so why don't we fill out the f prime sine number line first, and then we'll talk about what kind of conclusions we can draw from the information that we garner from the y prime sine number line. Okay. So let's see, we're going to have to get some test points here. Over here we could try maybe x equals 0 for a test point. So we're going to test point x equals 0. And do you remember where we're supposed to plug in the x equals 0? 
plug it into the derivative. That's right, because we're trying to find what's the sign of the derivative. So if we put a zero there and a zero there, we get the number five. And five is a positive number, and that means that any test point we would use in that region would give us a positive number. Okay, so then over here, maybe we get another test point, maybe x equals two. That's an appropriate point. If we stick a two in here, we get a negative. If we stick a two in here, we get a positive. Negative times positive is negative, and so that means all of these things here are negative. You guys getting the hang of this? Hopefully you remember this from last week. And then finally a test point over here. You could pick x equals 6 or you could pick x equals 6 million. Whichever you want, you're going to see that when you plug that in you get something that's positively signed, so then you get the plus plus plus. Okay, so now I'm going to erase the test points that I used because what I want to write here is any conclusions that I can draw. What kind of conclusions can I draw about the points x equals 1 and x equals 5? It's going to be something that speaks to the extra mo relative max or relative min. The function's going up, it hit a horizontal tangent, and then it's decreasing and going back down again. So right here, this is a max. That's right, it went up, it hit the top, and it's going down again. Now it's going down and it hit rock bottom and then it's going back up again. And so this one right here is a min. And so we have determined the locations of the relative min and the sorry, the relative max and the relative min of the function. Now also, if I happen to ask you for the intervals of increasing or decreasing, you could say that the function is increasing on the open interval from minus infinity all the way to 1. And then you could say it's decreasing on the open interval from 1 to 5. And then you could say that it's increasing on the open interval from 5 to infinity. This is all the information we get from this cute little y prime side number line. Isn't that awesome? We can see so much about this function, its behavior in each one of these intervals, and the classification of its extrema, all from this fabulous line. We could see even more from a graph. So actually, if you wanted to graph the original function, you can confirm all the analysis that you're doing over here with calculus. You should see a relative max at x equals 1 and a relative min at x equals 5, and you would get the corresponding xy points. Make sure that you're checking it with a graph, because that way we know if we're doing it right. Okay, so that's the y prime sine number line, and now we're going to draw the y double prime sine number line. So I'll just erase this so I have some more room. You guys understand that over here, this is where I'm going to mark off the sign of the second derivative. Then we can talk about what that might give us for information. All right, remember, something can only change sign, change from positive to negative, or vice versa, if it goes through zero. And that's in the case where it exists everywhere, which this is a case of. So that's why we set this equal to zero, and so we solve that out to get 2x is equal to 6, or x is equal to 3. Now right here, I want you guys to understand that this is not a critical point. A critical point, as defined in the lectures from last week, are locations where you have a horizontal tangent or the slope of the tangent line does not exist. This is the second derivative equal to zero. If you plug in the number x equals 3 into the first derivative, you should get a negative number. Now that's not zero, and that's not does not exist, and so x equals 3 is not a critical point. But it is something we got out of an equation that we solved for zero, and that's where the confusion comes from. So I don't want you to get confused on a test if I ask you to locate critical points, okay? The second derivative is merely locating candidates for inflection points, okay? So although x equals 3 is not a critical point, what is x equals 3? It's a candidate for an inflection point. It's a possible inflection point. Now I'm not saying that it's guaranteed inflection point yet. I have to first confirm whether or not the second derivative changed sign. If it did, yes it's an inflection point. If it did not change sign, no it is not an inflection point. Okay, so how are we going to figure out if it changed sign? Same way that we did it before. We're just going to throw in some test points. But in this case, when we test the test points, we're going to plug them into 
the second derivative. That's right. Just like on the f prime sine number line, this one was the prime sine. We took the test points and plugged them into y prime. On the y double prime sine number line, we're going to take the test point. Let's maybe make a test point out of x equals 2 for here. And we're going to plug it into y double prime because we want to know what the sine of it will be. Alright, so if I put x equals 2 right into this function right here, I get 2 y double prime equals 2 times 2 minus 6, which is minus 2, which is a negative number. So it's negative everywhere. All right, you see how many things you got to keep track of here, so you really have to conceptually understand what you're doing, or it's going to be very difficult for you to remember everything. I actually don't really want you to remember that much, as much as I want you to understand what you're doing and why. So we're plugging it into y double prime because we're testing the sign of y double prime. Okay, so likewise over here for this region right here, maybe we're going to make a test point out of x equals 4. And we're plugging it into y double prime because that's the sign of y double prime. And so we get y double prime 2 times 4 minus 6. And that's positive 2. So then we get the plus, plus, plus. All right. And so to make that a little bit clearer now, I'll erase the work that I did with the test points so it's not so crowded. And now we can just talk about what kind of conclusions that we can reach by having the information on a filled out y double prime sign number line. Okay, so question number one, is three an inflection point? Remember I said it was a candidate for one because I saw the second derivative hit zero? Is it confirmed as an inflection point? Yes, it sure is because the second derivative changed sign. So yes, x equals three is an inflection point. All right. Over what interval is the function f of x concave down? Why, over the interval where its second derivative would be negative, of course. And so you can see that the function here is going to be concave down over the open interval from minus infinity to 3. And likewise, over which interval is this function concave up? It's going to be concave up wherever its second derivative is positive, and so that's 3 to infinity. Okay, so for technicality, are you wondering why I'm using an open parenthesis notation here as opposed to a closed square bracket like this? If you are, then I'm glad you're thinking about it. And the reason is because words such as increasing, decreasing, and concave up, concave down, they say that the function's derivative has an actual sign, which is to say it has to be positive or has to be negative. It can't be zero. So I cannot put the square bracket here because the second derivative value is 0 at 3 and 0 is not a negative number. So x equals 3 is not a point where the function's concave down. It's not a point where the function's concave up. x equals 3 is an inflection point where the function has changed from being concave down to concave up again. Now I invite you to separately go on your calculator, computer, internet, what have you, and get a plot of this function right here. Take a look at it, and please confirm that everything we did on this video is correct. I hope you do. Okay, so I'm going to go through one more example here, and then you'll have to wait for the next video to see how this can apply to a business example. Now, in this example here, I'm going to give you functional forms not only for the function itself, but also for its first and second derivative. Okay, now I'm sure you guys would be able to get these because you know all the rules that would lead you to the conclusions of what the first and second derivatives are. And if you like, go ahead and take the definition of the function y and take its derivative once and then again and make sure that you're able to derive each one of these expressions. You should know how to get the derivative of y into this form and the derivative of this into this form. However, I'll say that these are pretty complicated. If you do it out, good for you. That's bonus practice. But I would not expect you to do something like this on a written timed exam because you can see you're going to need the product rule, you're going to need the quotient rule, it's going to get pretty complicated. Um, so don't worry about it if you have done it and you see that it's a little bit difficult, okay? 
let's say that I've given you y and its first and second derivatives. And again, I would want you to locate all the critical points, draw the y prime sine number line, draw the y double prime sine number line, and I would want you to draw appropriate conclusions. Okay. So this is similar to how you should be expected to be tested on this material if you're in my face-to-face -face class um, or in your midterms for the online people. I will ask you to draw the y prime, y double prime sign number lines. All right, and it's just as it was in the previous example. We have to solve for the places where this is equal to zero or does not exist, and this is equal to zero or does not exist, and then we have to do the test points and we have to see if it changes sign. Okay. Now this is a little bit harder. I didn't make you do the derivatives out per se, but I will make you solve for where this is either equal to zero or equal to does not exist. And you can see this one's got x's on the bottom. So we really have to be careful about that second one. Maybe there's an answer to an x value such that this function will not exist. Okay, so go ahead and solve those out right now. For what values of x does this fraction equal zero? If you remember from the previous videos, I told you guys that when you have a fraction and you want the fraction to be equal to zero, you only need to look for places where the numerator equals zero. That's going to answer the question, where does the whole function equal zero? Because you will be multiplying both sides of the equation by the denominator to cancel it out. Okay, so we only have to look for x values such that the numerator would be equal to zero, and you can see that x equals 2 solves that question quite nicely. Likewise, if you have a fraction and you want to know when is it equal to does not exist, you must just look at the bottom of the fraction here, um, barring any square roots, so we don't have square roots here. Divide by zeros are places where things go bad over the rules and we want to make sure that we don't divide by zero. But if we did divide by zero, what would happen to the function? It does not exist. So that means that x equals 0 answers this question right there. Okay, are these my critical points, x equals 0 and x equals 2? Yes, these are my critical points because solving out this equation for y prime is what gives you your critical points. Okay, so then we go to the y prime sine number line, we just have to tick off x equals 0 and x equals 2, and then we have to do the appropriate test points. Now, I'm going to leave that part up to you guys. Um, I hope that you will plug in a test point here, maybe x equals minus 1, and then you're going to plug that into, what are we plugging it into? Plugging it into y prime, that's right. All the test points on the y prime sine number line are plugged into y prime you should conclude that all of these values are negative here. Likewise, if you use the test point of x equals 1, for example, inside of the y prime here, you can see if I put a 1 here, it's negative on the top. If I put a 1 here, it's positive on the bottom. Negative over positive, negative. So that's how I got that negative. And likewise, I'm going to get positives over here if I plug in a really big number for a test point. And now let's see what kind of conclusions we can draw from this. Okay, let's go to the one where it changes sign first because that one's kind of easier. It was negative, and then it hit zero, and then it went positive. So what is that? That's a min. And so the conclusion we can draw here is that x equals 2 is a relative min. Okay? Over which intervals is this function decreasing? y is decreasing over from minus infinity to zero, and once again, from zero to two. Okay, notice how I did not include x equals zero inside of these two intervals. x equals zero is excluded because for a function to be decreasing, its derivative must exist and be negative. But at x equals zero, the derivative does not exist. So you cannot answer the question, um, where is it decreasing, with y is decreasing over minus infinity to 2. You must exclude the number x equals 0 because derivative doesn't even exist there. It's not really decreasing at that point. Okay, and then likewise y is increasing over the open interval from 2 to infinity. Okay, and what can we conclude about the point y equals zero, x equals 0? What can we conclude about this point right here? It's not a max, it's not a min, because it didn't change sign. 
Is it an HPI? Is it a horizontal point of inflection? This is actually similar to the video um, from last week when I showed you the exercises where the function itself, if you plot the function, it looks like this. And what happens right here is that it's not a horizontal point of inflection, but x equals zero is a vertical point of inflection. It's a VPI because it's a place where the inflection changes, as we will see next, but it's not horizontal, it's vertical. If you recall from last week when I did that video, the place where we got a VPI instead of an HPI, a vertical point of inflection, was a place, again, where the derivative did not exist. On a horizontal point of inflection, the derivative will exist. It will be equal to zero. On a vertical point of inflection, the derivative will not exist, and that's because it's a divide by zero, like a vertical asymptote, it's DNE. Okay, so this is an inflection point, but actually I don't want to write that on this graph right here. I don't want to write that. Because all your conclusions about inflection points really should be coming from the y double prime sine number line. Not from the y prime sine number line. Before when we told you to say that those are points of inflection, it was kind of skirting the issue because you had not been introduced properly to the second derivative in the concept of concavity and inflection. Okay, So now that you know about concavity and the second derivative, you need to go here to decide whether or not you have actual points of inflection. Solving this line gives you the critical points. Solving for this line, y double prime equals zero, or does not exist, gives you candidates for inflection points. Okay? So that's what it gets you. You see how these are two separate issues here? If I ask for critical points, you solve for that one. If I ask for candidates for inflection points, you solve out the second derivative equals zero or does not exist. You see the does not exist still comes into play. All right, um, so let's solve that out in the same manner we solved it before. How would I make this fraction right here equal zero? The top would have to equal zero. How would the top equal zero? When x is minus four, that's right. So this question is answered when x is equal to minus four. That's what makes the numerator zero. What about does not exist on a fraction? That will be if you divide by zero. And when is that going to happen? When x equals zero. And so the answer to this question is x equals zero. You see how x equals zero turned out to be an answer to this question and this question? So it actually is a critical point as well as a possible candidate for an inflection point. But I'm not going to confirm that yet until I make sure that I know that the derivative changed sign at that place. All right? So to make any conclusions about the inflection points or to make conclusions about intervals of concave up or concave down, we must determine the sign of the second derivative and we will do that again with the test points. So I invite you to do that on your own. What you're doing is taking a number in this region such as x equals minus 1 and plugging it into the second derivative. What would happen if I put a minus 1 here and then I put a minus 1 down there? I'll get a positive number up here I would get a negative number down there, and so I get a positive, sorry, it should be a positive over a negative. It should be positive, positive. Oh no, I might have a typo in here. Let's see. All right, well, I'm going with positive because if I actually try it here, it says positive on my page. I think it's negative, though. Sorry, let me try this out for you guys. Oh, I see what happens. Sorry, at least I figured it out on the video. Here's what happens, okay? X is equal to minus 4. That's what happened there. So I drew this a little bit wrong. I apologize for that, but at least I caught it inside the video. Okay, the actual two candidates here are X equals 0 and X equals minus 4. Did you guys catch that? Were you getting confused on there? Sorry about that. Um, so these are the proper points here because you see minus 4 in the X is what causes that, okay? So we don't even really need this much space over here. All right, so like I was saying, if I plugged in x equals minus 1 here, I should get a positive number on the top and a negative number on the bottom. Positive over negative is negative, and that's why I get negative. Likewise, if I use a candidate like, I mean, sorry, if I use a test point like x equals minus 5, 
I would get a negative number on the top and a negative number on the bottom. Two negatives make a positive when you divide them, and so I get positive. And likewise, if I picked a large positive test point over here, I should get positive over positive. And so there you go. That's your proper y prime sine number line. What kind of conclusions can we make from this? Well, the concavity change sign at x equals minus 4. The concavity change sign at x equals 0. And so therefore, x equals minus 4 and x equals 0 are both inflection points. See, that's really the proper way to determine whether something is an inflection point or not is whether or not the second derivative change sign. And if I ask you for intervals of concavity, like for example, if I ask you over which interval is a function y concave up, what would you say? You would say y is concave up over the interval from minus infinity to minus 4, and again, it's concave up over the interval 0 to infinity. You see that? Because when you ask if it's concave up, you just want to give the intervals, the x values, such that the second derivative is positive. And then if I ask you for where is y concave down, you would say y is concave down on the interval from minus 4 to 0. And sorry, I've got so much going on here on the board, but please note that all the answers to intervals of concavity or increasing, decreasing are all open intervals because we do need to have a concrete sign on the first or second derivative. All right, so now you know how to draw all the conclusions you possibly can from these two fabulous number lines, and in the next video, I will show you how it relates to business.